So I feel like recently in a lot of my sort of casual conversations that I have said the following phrase a lot recently, and it's, it's this phrase, time flies. Well, where has the time gone? I mean, I can't believe how tall he is. Man, time flies. I can't believe she's almost in kindergarten. Man, time flies. I can't believe it's almost May. School will be out before you know it. Time flies. And isn't this true that um, the older you get, the faster time flies? Isn't that true? Like, <clears throat> there must be sci- something scientific about it. Because I remember when I was in kindergarten, I have this distinct memory of seniors in high school coming into our kindergarten room, and I had this thought of, I-, I don't think I'll ever graduate high school. Like, that seems like forever away. Like, they're so old. And and when you're in elementary school, it really does go by slowly. It just, the time creeps along, and then, you know, you get into middle school, high school, it goes a little quicker, college kind of amps up a little bit, and then for me, young adulthood went a little bit faster, and you get married, and then you start having kids, and time doesn't just fly, it just rockets, right? It just, I mean, you blink, and, and it's absolutely gone. So I, I discovered this website recently. Um, you should not go there. It's called deathclock.com. And uh, <clears throat> so I went to this website, and you, you answer a few questions. Like, you get to answer, um, what's your BMI? What's your age? Are you a sadist or normal? Or are you a pessimist or optimist? You can click a few things. And you hit enter, and it tells you the exact day that you die. And so, <laughs> again, don't do this. It's, it's very morbid. So I discovered that I'm going to die on Sunday, May 21st, 2051. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's way too soon. Like, I don't want to die at the age of 73. So I went back, and I changed it from normal to optimist. And I gained another 17 years, (laughs) right? So just being optimistic. Now, this is the, the thing that actually you should be a little bit concerned about this, okay? Because in both scenarios, I die on a Sunday, which means... Right? Like, when I'm up here, that, that might be it. Like, you thought Brad's message last week was memorable? Like, that, that could be memorable. Um, so, he, he, here's, <laughs> you know, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, it, it's interesting that even though we know that time flies, I still find myself wishing my time away. Isn't that interesting? Like, I have a 14-year-old, and I have thought to myself so many times recently, I can't wait till he's 16, because then he could help drive some kids around, right? Or like, I can't wait till she gets to kindergarten, because then we'll have, you know, this extra time in the morning, and, and, and I find myself wishing my time away. But here's what's also true, and I think maybe most people cannot relate to this. Maybe there's a couple of you that can relate to this, is when my, when my wish finally arrives, I'm often surprised, and not in a good way. So here's a couple silly examples. So I grew up in Pittsburgh, I'm a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan, and in the 80s, the Steelers were terrible, but in the 90s, they started to get really good. And in, like, 1995, they they made it to Super Bowl, lost, and then late 90s, early 2000s, they were really good, and they almost got there. And every year, I would be like, I can't wait till the Steelers win the Super Bowl, it's going to change my life, right? I can't wait, I can't wait. And then in 2005, they finally did it, they won the Super Bowl, right? And you're like, yeah, and the confetti's flying, and they're doing the interviews afterwards, the post-game interviews. And I, I'll never forget the moment where after all the interviews, you know, a couple hours after the end of the Super Bowl, because you're kind of, I turned the TV off, and I thought to myself, I still got to go to work tomorrow. Like, I still got the same problems. I still, actually, I don't think my life has changed at all. And I started to get kind of depressed. It, when the Steelers finally won the Super Bowl, it was kind of a letdown. Now, I know you Buffalo Bills fans are like, I'd like to experiment with that letdown. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to win it one of these days, and you're going to be like, I know exactly what you're talking about, because it, it's kind of a letdown when it finally arrives. Or a lot, you might not be able to relate to this, but when it comes to vacations, you finally book that vacation because you see this picture, and you're like, oh, it's going to be awesome, right? And then a month gets there, and you're like, oh, it's only a month away. Right? And then three weeks, oh, it's only three, two weeks, a week, and you start getting really, really excited. And then you go on the actual vacation, and you're like, that really wasn't very much fun. Like the vacation, like the excitement leading up to the vacation was great, but the actual vacation, you need a vacation from. Because it's like, you sit out there, it's too hot, 
and you're like, where did the kid go? Did they drown? Are they, you know, playing video games and back at the house for hours and hours? Like the actual vacation is not very much fun. So for me, I'm often surprised at how disappointing it is when the thing that you wish for actually arrives. So why do I wish so much of my time away? Now, some of you, you're kind of at the other end of the spectrum. And last week when Brad talked about devices, you know, cutting back on technology, you had this thought. You quoted that song by Cher, if I could only turn back time, right? Because you're like, now my kids are out of the house, or now my kids are in college, and how on earth am I going to apply what he talked about last week? I wish I could turn back time. I wish that I could redo things, because I think, I, I think I've got some regrets. And some of you kind of deal with some regrets because of the way that you've used your time in the past. Um, there's, a, there's some people in the church that recently became empty nesters, and this is one emotion that I simply cannot relate to. And I'll, I'll talk to empty nesters who, like, you know, the kids go away to college, and then you're sitting there with your husband or your spouse, and you're like, what, what was your name again? You know, like, how do, we, how do we live this new life together? And it's difficult, and you miss the activity and the chaos. I had one lady from the church a couple of years, maybe last year she came up to me, and I'm like in the middle of it, right? Because I got little ones at home and it's just, our, our, our house is just chaos, right? And she comes up to me because her kids recently got out of the house. She's an empty nester. And I, this woman I deeply admire and respect. And she said to me, cherish every moment you have with those kids because my kids are out of the house and I long for those days when I had the little ones at home. And when she, when she said that, I, had, I thought to myself, have you lost your mind? <laughs> like, if I could have three days of empty nesting, it would change my life, right? So all that to say is, like, if I could get in the mind of an empty nester for, like, an hour, it probably would change my life because I cannot relate to the pain <laughs> of an empty nester. But one day I will, and I'll remember all the advice that you gave me. So all that to say, all that to say is, I, and some of you can relate to this, I wish I could stop wishing my time away and enjoy the struggle bus today. Because when we're driving the struggle bus where we're in the struggle bus and you're hitting all those potholes, right? And the destination seems so far away. It's so easy to just wish our time away or it's so easy to regret the time that we've wasted in the past. So how do we do this? How do we get to the point where we can live in the moment? There's, there's a verse in the Psalms that says, today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How do we get to that place where we really can enjoy this moment where you're not looking at your watch, you're not thinking about this afternoon, but like this moment, this day with my kids, with my grandkids, in this season of life, whatever life, season of life God has put you in, to just enjoy it. How do we do that, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Psalm chapter 90. This is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Now, he didn't refer to himself as the man of God. He, you know, whoever put the Psalms together in, in the Old Testament came up with this, this heading of what Moses wrote. Moses is a great guy to, to learn from because he had such an ex, uh, extraordinary life. His life was really split up into three seasons, right? Season number one was birth through age 40, where he grew up in an Egyptian palace, where you know, he, he ate like an Egyptian, he talked like an Egyptian, and he walked like, that joke never gets old. Some of you are like, yeah, that got old like four years ago. And then he's like, I, you know, he ends up killing an Egyptian, so he's got to flee the palace, and he ends up in the wilderness from age 40 to 80, and he's probably thinking to himself, I'm going to die right around the age of 80, because people didn't live past 80 in those days, at least most didn't. I'm going to die in anonymity. Nobody's going to know my name. And I'm just going to die with my wife and my father-in-law and a bunch of sheep around me. But then, <laughs> at the age of 80, this is incredible. At the age of 80, God's like, now I got you right where I want you. I have trained you for 80 years for this very specific purpose. One day, as he's tending his sheep, all of the sudden, God speaks to him in a burning bush. And he says, you're going to go to Pharaoh. And you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go free because they've been in bondage for 430 years. And, you know, there's the, it's a long story in Exodus. You can read it. It's amazing. Eventually, he leads the people through the Red Sea 
in this miraculous moment where a couple million, probably, scholars think around two million, Israelites leave bondage in Egypt that had been going on for 430 years, and now he goes from leading sheep to leading like two million Israelites. It's, it's extraordinary. And here he is. They call, they call this group the children of Israel because they're like children. They're people who are trying to figure out who God is and trying to figure out how to relate to one another. And how are we supposed to do life now? What, what, what does God want from us? What's he expect from us? And Moses is like the guy. He's the leader. And God says, okay, I've got something good for you. I want you to move this people into the promised land, which is right over the Jordan River. So here's your directions. I want you to get 12 guys, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and I want them to scout out the promised land and come back and tell everybody how awesome the promised land is. You got it? All right, I got it. So he gets these 12 guys, and they go over, and they look at this this land that's flowing with milk and honey, this beautiful piece of real estate. You can visit it today on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's 70 degrees and sunny all year round, and... It's, got, it's this great piece of, of land that God has for his people. But these 12 guys look at it, and they're like, there's no way we can take that. Like, you got a bunch of people that look like Shaquille O'Neal guarding the doorstep. You've got thick walls, well-fortified cities. There's no way. So they come back, except for two men. Two men, Caleb and Joshua, were like, we can take it, we can take it. But these other 10 guys are like, are you serious? There's no way. I mean, they got big armies. It's large. There's no way we can do it. And they lead all of the other Israelites to say, I guess God tricked us. I guess God duped us. We can't really trust that God is going to bring us into the promised land. And so because of their unfaithfulness, because of their disobedience, God says, all right, before I can bring you into the promised land, you first need to get to know the promise keeper. And so I'm going to ground you. Remember when you were a kid and you got grounded? They got grounded in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unfaithfulness. And Moses is probably like, welcome to the struggle bus, right? He's got to lead these people. So this is why Moses is such a great person to learn from, because for the first 40 years, he's in the palace, then he's in the desert, and now he's leading this group of people, the children of Israel, who when you read the account, it's like they're, they're complaining and they're whining and they don't want to be there, and Moses is leading them the entire way. So here's Moses driving the family struggle bus, and here's what he writes in Psalm chapter 90, beginning with verse 1. This is so good. This is so good. Here's what he, here's what he says. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before Abraham was, I am, God said. Before the earth was put into motion, God was there. God is the creator of the universe. God was there for Abraham. God was there even when they were in slavery for 430 years. God has always been there for them, even when it felt like God was distant. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Even though I don't really like driving the struggle bus in the middle of this wilderness, I'm recognizing that you are eternal. You have always been there. You are here now, and you will always be there. You are God from everlasting to everlasting. You are the alpha and the omega. You are from A to Z. And I just want to recognize, Moses says, that you turn men back to dust, saying, return to dust, those sons of man. Saying, God, you are the creator and the author and the sustainer and the savior and the finisher of my life. You have the final say when it comes to life and death. You are sovereign over all, which means he can step in at any time and do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And then he gives this interesting perspective on time. He says, for a thousand years in your sight or like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. A watch in the night was about three or four hours when everybody was sleeping. Somebody would stand out and they would guard for a watch in the night. See, God's timetable is so much different than ours. Time feels differently to God than it does for us a thousand years. It's like a, it's like a day 
to God. Now, I, I did the quick math on this. And if you live to be 90 years old, and I'm hoping I'll make it to 93 because both my grandfathers passed away when they were 93. Let's say I make it to 90 years old. Let's say the death clock was right. I, I get about two hours and 25 minutes in God's mind. And I'm 46, which means I'm about halfway there, which means I get one hour and 13 minutes. It's, it goes by like that. It's quick. It's quick. But God's always been there. He says, you, you sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening, it's dry and it's withered. It just goes by so quickly. We are consumed by your anger. Again, this is partly a lament because he's struggling with the fact that they have to pay this this 40-year sentence for their unfaithfulness. We're consumed by your anger and we're terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And I I would submit to you that there's, there's really no such thing as secret sins. I mean... If you think that you're getting away with sin that nobody else sees, chances are your kids probably know about it, your spouse senses it, and God already knows about it because everything's laid bare before him who knows all things and sees all things. And he says, all our days pass away under your wrath, and we finish our years with a moan. Um, the, the best person, or I, I should say the person that I know who maybe had the best end of all was Jen's grandfather, my wife's grandfather, who th- I think three years ago passed away at the age of 96 in his sleep. And right before his passing, the day before he was doing fine, he was checking his stocks, vacuuming, doing great. And then he passed away. And I thought to myself, that's about as good as it gets, right? Where you make it, to the age of 96, your mind is still sharp and you pass away in the middle of the night, but still he, he passes away with a moan, right? And then people come and they get the body and it's, it's kind of traumatic for the, the loved ones involved. And that's like the best case scenario. For most of us, it's not going to end well, right? For most of us, it ends with a moan. It ends with being hooked up to a machine, or it ends with cancer taking us, or our our heart failing, or morphine flooding through. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning for this upbeat message here? It it does not end well. For most of us, it it ends with a moan, and it's pain. I mean, none of us on our deathbed are going to be like giving everybody a high five, saying, hey, thanks for being here. You guys were awesome. Yeah, I feel great. Peace. And then I guess not how it's going to end. It's going to end with a moan. It's not going to end well. It's not going to look well. It's, it's going to end with a moan. Now, as a pastor, I've told you guys this a thousand times. As a pastor, one of the greatest privileges is for me to be able to do funerals. And almost every time somebody calls a church and says, hey, can pastor do a funeral? I say yes, because Easter Sunday and funerals are the two best opportunities to share the gospel. And funerals also are a, a moment where we get to reflect on our own mortality because we see that it's not going to end well for any of us. And our time goes by like that. Moses says, the length of our days is 70 years or 80. I mean, he's already gone past 80, but that's kind of the lifespan, you know? If we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass. And we all, if you know the song, fly away, O glory, I'll fly away. I don't know the rest of the song, but (laughs) it's like, yeah, I mean, that's like the most depressing hymn, but it's it's true. Like, death is going to get us all, and then we fly away, and you have your funeral, and then everybody moves on with the rest of their lives, and it goes by in two hours and 35 minutes. Who knows the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. It's this moment where Moses is just in awe of the power and the sovereignty and the majesty of God. 
Here's his summary, if I could put it into my own words. The, the desert is a struggle. But, and some of you right now, you're parenting little ones. Maybe you're taking care of an aging parent. Or maybe you're in middle school. And it feels like the desert. It feels like the struggle bus is getting bumpier and bumpier as you go along. And in those moments, it's, tempted to, it's tempting to wish away those days. But life is short, Moses says. God is sovereign over life and death. And I don't mean to sound insensitive, and this, this, this statement could come across very insensitively, but let, let me just say this. When a child dies, we often say they died too soon. Their life was too short. And when someone in their 90s or 100 dies, we often say they lived a good, long life. But the reality is no matter when you die, whether you're small or whether you're old, your life goes by like that. It's quick. So in light of all of this, Moses gives us a truth. He gives us a prayer that will help us to stop wishing our days away. Because, isn't it true? We kind of live as if we're going to live forever. I mean, we know that we're going to die around 80, 90, you know, if God grants us that, notwithstanding a tragedy. But we kind of live our lives as if we're going to live forever, so I can just wish away these seasons. And Moses is saying, no, you need to actually stop and pause and pray this prayer. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom, because I need a heart of wisdom, how to use my time, because I don't have much of it. So God, would you teach me to number my days, because at the end of the day, my days are numbered. It's going to go by like that. So God, teach me to number my days. Help me to realize that I really only have a few days left. And may I have the wisdom to know what to do with this time, that you have sovereignly granted to me. You know, David, who wrote most of the Psalms, agreed with Moses. David, the shepherd turned king, man after God's own heart, the greatest king in Israel, he said the same thing. He said, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. Remind me of that because I just sort of think I'm going to live forever. I mean, you have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. <sighs> I mean, James said the same thing. James said, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Imagine taking a spray bottle. Whew. It's there, and then it's gone. Back to David, who said, we're merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Sometimes I feel like the goal of our lives is to just get busier and busier. So I got, I got a dare for you. I dare you to do this this week. Somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how's it going? Instead of saying, I'm busy, say to them, when they say, how's it going, say, I'm dying. And they'll be like, seriously? And if you're like in your mid-40s, you can say, yeah, and I only got about an hour and 13 minutes left, so you better not, you know, time, time's ticking here, right? <laughs> and so, Lord, where do I put my hope? Where do I put my hope? You know where we so often put our hope? We put our hope in reason. We put our hope in reasonableness. We put our hope in just kind of what everybody else does. This is what the, the scouts did when they looked at the promised land and they had that look on their face of like, it is unreasonable, God, to ask us to go in and take that land. We're gonna die, that's unreasonable. How could you ask us to do that, God? This is the same look that I had on my face and you had on your face last week when Brad Huddleston was like, you should do X, Y, Z with technology and electronics. We were like, that's unreasonable. That's kind of radical, right? I mean, come on. But often when you want to receive what God wants to bless you with, it's going to mean you might have to do something unreasonable. I love what Craig Grishel, he's a pastor from Oklahoma, writes. He says, if you want to break out of what is and break into what could be, there will be times when you need to be strategically unreasonable. 
And instead of just being busy, instead of just doing this, ah, kind of running around, wishing my days away, that you would be unreasonable and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, in some cases, take a drastic step. Maybe it's with your devices. We talked about this last week. So that I can find my hope in you. Because at the end of the day, the goal of your life and my life is to please God. Paul agreed with this, right? Paul, who very easily could have been consumed by regret. I actually think that Paul probably did struggle with some regret in his life. I mean, he put Christians in prison. He divided households. He was part of the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. I think he probably struggled with regret when he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. And I think some of you might struggle with regret the rest of your life. That's okay. We all have regrets that we're all going to struggle with for years and years. But Paul's still able to say, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are slipping by. To make the most of today. Jesus says, tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Let's, let's enjoy today. Let's enjoy the struggle bus today. Even if they're little and you're changing diapers and they're driving you, maybe, maybe they're old and you're changing diapers. The struggle bus is a good thing to be on today. So don't so quickly hit the eject button. Here's what, here's what I want to challenge you to do with your, with your week this week. Because you're going to wish your days away. I can't wait till evening I can put those kids to bed. I can't wait till Saturday. I can't wait till the summertime. This is what you're going to do this week. You're going to pray this prayer that Moses taught us to pray. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom because I need the wisdom to know what to do with this we little bit of time that you have given me. Because isn't it true? Isn't it true that we live our lives thinking that we've got all kinds of time? Even if you're here and you're in middle school and you're like, oh, I got all kind of time. Goes by in an instant. Goes by in an instant. So God, would you teach us to number our days aright? that I may gain a heart of wisdom and that I may know what to do with this precious time that you have given me. God, teach me. Train me, right? Training connotes doing things we don't naturally do. Would you teach me to use my moments well? Would you teach me, as they said in that great movie, Dead Poet Society, to carpe diem, to seize the day, to not just wish my days away, but to make the most of every opportunity, even when I don't like the desert that you've given me, even when I just want my kids out of the house. Would you help me to enjoy this day? Because this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. God, would you teach me to number my days? Because it is true that my days are, in fact, numbered. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come up right now. And as they're on their way up here, I want to just, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about one of my very favorite guys in the Bible who who shows up in this account. His name's Caleb. And I love Caleb because he crossed the Red Sea at the age of 45, which was right around the age I was. And He's one of those stout at heart men and he get through the Red Sea and he's like, all right, let's do this. And he goes out and he sees the, the promised land and the big grapes and the, the beautiful city. And he's like, we can take it. We can take it. But everyone else distracts him. And as a result, they spent 40 years in the wilderness and it wasn't his fault. And yet he was forced to be on the struggle bus even though he's the one that had faith. And when it finally comes time, after they pay the 40-year price, Finally comes time for them to go inherit the promised land, to take it over. Caleb says this. At the age of 85, he says, here I am today. 
I'm 85 years old. And I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out, and I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. So you might be here today and you're 85 years old. Maybe you're 70 years old. And you, see, you understand this message better than anybody, right? Because you can kind of see the finish line. It's never too late. It's never too late to seize the day. It's never too late to make a difference for the kingdom. In some cases, those of you who are retired can make a greater impact for the kingdom of God than the rest of us because you're like a library of, of wisdom and a library of information, and you have more time or free time in some cases to serve the Lord. So I want to say to those of you who are in your latter years to be like Caleb and say, I might be 85 years old and I might not be able to move as well as I did when I was 45 or 25, but I got a heart of vigor because I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm called by God to use these final moments for his glory. And he says this, give me the hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourselves heard that the Anakites or the giants were there and their cities were large and fortified and it seems a little bit unreasonable and it seems like a mountain that's too high to climb, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out because when God says it, he's going to do it. And so I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean out on my own understanding because my own understanding and my own reason gets shallow. So I'm going to trust you because when you say it, you're going to do it, so let's go. And here we are, 3,500 years later, talking about Caleb and his vigor at the age of 85. He's not here right now, but I think he'll be here in the second service. Matt, Pastor Peace, you know, he's 96 years old, and he's still amen in my sermons, and he's still encouraging me, and he's still got a positive attitude. I hope I'm like that. The death clock tells me I won't get there, but I hope I'm like that when I'm 96 years old. I hope I'm just as vigorous as Pastor Peace and Caleb, and I hope that all of us will pause and say, I got two hours left, and I'm going to use it well, and I'm not going to wish it away, and I'm going to seize the moment, and I'm going to seize the day for whatever time I have left. God, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for this ancient, ancient text that is still so applicable because it's been breathed by God himself through the pen of Moses, and here we are being blessed by it today. What a blessing. Would you teach us to number our days aright so that we may gain a heart of wisdom? Would you help us to not wish any of these days away, no matter how difficult they may be? And would you help us to make the most of every opportunity that you give us? We pray this in the matchless, awesome name of the God who is sovereign, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.